Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. It's May 6th, and the Flames are finally back in the second round series. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, we waited this week to record a little bit later, so we had some good news, and I'm glad we did. How you doing, man? Good. That game last night, that was something else. Yeah, it was. And, you know, it, it could have gone right, which it did, or it could have been horribly wrong. I think if we were to have gone down three games to none to the Ducks, we're pretty much done. Yeah, this, the tenor of this show would be more of a, well, that was a good year instead of, well, hey, we can get back into it. Yeah, it was kind of it was kind of scary there for a while, but we'll talk about that. Why don't we start at the beginning of the series since we haven't really talked since the series started and uh, move our way back. Sounds like a plan. We talked just before the Ducks series. We made some predictions. We predicted the Ducks were going to be hard to play against and that we'd probably have some uh, issues in the Honda Center. And in game one, which was played last week, uh, that turned out to be true as the Ducks pounced on the Flames early and took a 6-1 to one victory in the first game. I don't know about you, but I had to turn that one off. Yeah, unfortunately, because I write the post-game articles, I had to stick with it right through to the final buzzer. And, yeah, that wasn't exactly the most pretty of a game <laughs> from the Flames. It looked, it almost looked like, you know, David versus Goliath. It looked like the best team in the league playing against the Oilers or something. I expect us to lose, but I didn't expect it to be that bad. And... Now I know why the Ducks are the number two team in, or the number one team in the West, I should say, because they knew how to come out and play against us. I mean, they took every everything you could do against the Ducks. They did every you know every possible advantage they could take. They took, and I think the biggest thing I noticed in both of the two first games, the Ducks really knew how to make the Flames skate. They do whatever it took to get that puck into our end and make us have to skate and get it and get tired. Yeah, and the Flames, they didn't uh, play the game as effectively. They basically played Anaheim as if they were playing Vancouver. And, like, the Sedins, they're a very passive duo where they'll just look for the pass. But guys like Corey Perry and Ryan Getzlaff, like, they do look for the pass to continue the cycle, but if there is a lane to the net, they'll take it, and they'll skate right in and try and score that way. And, like, we saw uh, the last goal that Hiller allowed in Game 1, uh, Dennis Weidman backed off, and Corey Perry was able to just skate out in front of Hiller all by himself and put it in. Yeah, it, it was like, you're right, it's like the Flames are still playing against the Canucks. I mean, they, they didn't seem to know how to counterbalance the Ducks. And it, I don't think it helped either. The Ducks had the last change, so they could always put their top line out against one of our weaker lines. Yeah, and then in, uh, like, as the game went on, like, you could see that they knew how to to beat Jonas Hiller and the shots that they were taking were pretty much perfect to in order to beat him and Kari Ramo didn't fare much better but you know it's one of those things that the Flames kind of got caught with their pants down and that does happen occasionally like, even in 2004, I do believe uh, when they were playing Detroit, the second game, they got outscored something like 6-2 or something like that in that game. So, it does happen. And, you know, even if you look back through the season, I mean, everybody has a game or two where they get blown out. And the Flames came into this game, we talked about it um, in our last show, the Flames came into this game telling people that, you know, the Ducks are mighty, the the Ducks are going to be hard to beat, and I think that might have got to their heads a bit, that, you know, we're taking on the Ducks, and I think once the Ducks started getting up on them, they just fell apart. Yeah, it was interesting that the Flames didn't have a significant pushback at all in that game. 
And even in the second game, they w were finding it difficult to find seams to take shots, even. Well, let's talk about that second game then. So uh, the second game in uh, this round was again at the Honda Center. And it was a 3 nothing victory for the Ducks. And this one, I don't think, tells the whole story. I think that the Flames finally started to find their legs again, if you will. And I think the second half of this game, we started to see the Flames fighting back. Yeah, the Flames, they were kind of caught off guard in the first 10 minutes because they were anticipating the same Anaheim team that they played in Game 1. But Anaheim itself changed how they played and were more effective at breaking out of their own zone. And that allowed uh, them to get eight or nine two-on-ones, three-on-twos, and all that. And eventually led to uh, the opening goal about seven, eight minutes in after Kari Ramo made at least a half dozen spectacular saves. Yeah, it was... Uh... It was definitely a closer game. Once you're right about Anaheim, once they were, you know, breaking out and the Flames got caught flat footed, they were able to have early success. And that was why we got the Bolesky goal early. But I think the Flames were able to eventually counteract that four check and that breakout. And I don't know about you, but I think about the last 10 minutes of the second period and most of the third, the Flames, I thought, put up a pretty good fight against the Ducks. Yeah. Uh a good bounce for Calgary, and the game's tied instead of them scoring the 2 nothing goal. It's just, for whatever reason, the bounces weren't going our way, and it seemed like every time the Flames would shoot, a guy would get his stick or his leg in front of it. Just nothing seemed to work, and, you know, that does happen occasionally. And Anderson's also a you know a great goaltender, and I think you know we can't give it all to sticks and legs. Anderson saved some pretty good saves in that game. Yeah, exactly. And you know, it, sometimes it's just not your night, and that was another one where Calgary just didn't have it. Yeah, and it was it was a little bit uh, concerning at first. I think that the Flames were looking poor and like they were caught off guard again at the beginning of that game and i i know i got worried i thought crap like they've got our number in this series we're done but even by the end of uh, the second game when anaheim scored their third goal it was empty net so i don't think a three nothing necessarily tells the whole story there um i was confident by the end coming back to calgary that the flames would probably be able to mount a better offense in game three yeah so was i like you could tell that those chances, if they just kept with it, that instead of the, you know the the Ducks blocking the shots or Anderson making good saves, that some would eventually find the back of the net. Yeah, and it's not that Anderson looked bad. It's just that it seemed like the Flames. I don't know. They figured out. Um, I guess they figured out how to get through the Ducks. Four check is probably the the best way to look at it. Like they just seemed like they were more confident in themselves. And they knew what they had to do to put that puck on the net. Well, one of the things that I've noticed about Anderson, because I've liked him ever since he was playing in Denmark, is that he has trouble at times with looking around screens. Like, he's not very active in his net when there's somebody blocking him. And back in November, when the Flames beat the Ducks in the shootout, uh, two of the three goals were point shots where somebody, I think one of them was even Gaudreau that was in front, but just enough of a screen to screw with Anderson's view and enough for the puck to go past. And like we saw that with the Backland overtime winner, that there was a lot of bodies in front and you didn't see Anderson like trying to look through legs and that for the puck and the puck just sailed right by him and in for sure yeah you're right he's not I've noticed Anderson this I mean I you know I know of him I've seen him a lot but I've really been paying attention to him mostly this round and going back and watching some stuff from last round and 
he seems like he, you're right, he doesn't stray from his net much. He stays very close to his net, um, and he doesn't move. And if you can get in his way, he doesn't seem like the guy who's going to slash you, the guy who's going to try and move that player out of his net as aggressively as some other goalies might. Yeah, like when he was in Denmark, the thing that was most remarkable about him is that he's six foot three and two hundred and fifty pounds, and like he just takes up a huge amount of the net. And even with Anaheim, like he's not particularly good with rebound control either. But when you're playing with a team like the Ducks, who have so many good defensemen, any rebounds get cleared quite easily. And, you know, their defensemen can just push a lot of the players out of the way. So that, I believe, is part of the reason why he's had so much much success at the NHL level, even though he's only, I think, in his third year. Yeah, he could be right. He could be right. That sounds pretty logical. Um, Going back to game one for a sec, we saw the goalies change there. We saw Hiller uh, get taken out and Ramo put in, and then Ramo started his first playoff game. They started in game two. What did you think of Ramo's performance in game two? Uh, If it was not for Ramo, the score probably would have been a mirror image of game one. Yeah, he really stood on his head to to give the Flames a chance to stay in it. Yeah, and sometimes you need an excellent performance, even if you do end up losing the game. Like it's like if you remember back in the O seven seri- season uh, when the Flames played Detroit, like you had Kipper. It was like he was the only player playing for Calgary. That's how lopsided that series was, and his. He almost willed the Flames to beat the Red Wings that, that year. And, you know, he, that helps to spur the team on that when you have a guy that is putting it all on the line and, you know, I should pick up my game because he's doing so well. Well, and, and that's it. I think that, you know, even early on in some of these games with the team like the Flames who we know do well late, He's given the Flames more time to get into that game because he's doing such a good job of defending his net and and keeping keeping the Flames in early when they need that boost. Exactly. And like we saw it even in overtime in Game 3 that the Flames were looking like a disaster in the first two minutes of the overtime. And Ramo made a pair of really dynamite saves to keep the flames alive in the game and eventually the flames ended up winning the game a couple of minutes after that yeah and it's you know if nothing else i think that and i know this from playing hockey at you know i haven't played at as nearly as high a level as the nhl but anytime you've got a goalie in who you're confident in it makes the whole team that much more confident and i think especially in those first two games all the Flames really needed at this point was confidence. Yeah, and you can build on it. And like even last night, uh, when they only had nine shots after two periods, they still had like eight good scoring chances. And like even though they were trailing, like they didn't feel out of it. And then we saw in the third period they just kept coming on in waves until eventually Gaudreau tied it. Yeah, so it was it was a rough two games. Um, if you're honest, after game two, when you were looking at the score, you're looking at what the Flames did. What were your thoughts coming home? I thought the Flames were going to win game three, and I thought the Flames are. I still think the Flames are going to win the series. So you weren't at all that you weren't at all thinking this was going to be four and out. The Flames are probably the weirdest, most re- resilient team I've ever watched playing hockey. So, I never count them out. Like, even if they get blown out like they did in Game 1 and 2, it, it didn't really phase me much. It's kind. This team has me believing, like, even if they were down 6 nothing 
with their back against the wall, I would still think that there's a chance that they might actually come from behind by from six goals to win it. That's just there's just something about this team that I don't know. It's weird. And I thought that they had a very good chance winning yesterday and I still think they're gonna win the series. So you you thought that coming in with the two nothing um the two nothing deficit that it's a setback but it wasn't gonna end end the year for the Flames. No, not at all. Uh, put it this way, I don't think that any team's gonna like I won't believe that an, a team will eliminate the Flames until the final buzzer goes and it is over. <laughs> It's a good way to look at it, Matt, because I know a lot of people that I talk to both online, through Twitter, through Facebook, and also, um, you know, people I know, people that I talk to around the city, a lot of people are starting to get nervous that after two games at the pond, if the Flames couldn't win it, that they probably wouldn't uh, make it out of this series. And, you know, that could happen. Like, Anaheim could bounce back in Game 4, and then we lose in Anaheim in Game 5, and that's that but i just there's something unusual about this team where like no matter how much you think you have them right where you want them they still find a way well that's i mean their slogan for this year is never quit and i think you know they couldn't have picked a better slogan at the beginning of the year than that because that really describes the flame season so far yeah and i'm it, it's just such a magical ride to be watching as a fan because it, there's no like one that you would see games like go back when the flames had a Ginla and all that like if the flames started losing the game you, you pretty much knew that it was over with no real thought that the flames would actually find a way to tie it or win it but this team, when they're down, it's like, okay, when are we gonna score to get back in this? Well, let's look at the uh, let's look at the game from yesterday, the home game. Um, the Flames came home. I thought if the Flames could win this game, that there would still be a chance. But I thought if the Flames lost this game and went down three games to none to the Ducks, that we were pretty much finished. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, well. Uh- I think it's like only like 3% of series have ever seen a team come down from from behind from 3-0 down and you know you look at the strength of the Flames and the Ducks yeah that ain't going to happen no <laughs> you know last year when LA came back from San Jose uh from 3-0 down to beat the Sharks well you you can kind of understand that because of the fact that it's san jose and they're not a very good team but la you know well they ended up winning the stanley cup so it made some sense that that was able to happen but if calgary went down three nothing like they might force it back to anaheim but that would be it (laughs) yeah I think this third game is probably worth a bit more of an in-depth discussion because there's actually some positive things to talk about from the Flames. Um, we saw, as usual, the electric Saddle Dome. Um, I was watching on TV, but you were there. Was the Saddle Dome any different in energy than it was in the first round? Uh, it was more like a regular season game, uh, like closer to that than a playoff game until the third period and i think it was just a lot of nerves by people i got when the flames scored obviously both the first two goals the dome was rather electric but there was a lot more nervousness in the building which is understandable you know you're down two zip in the series you're not exactly gonna be you know cheering as much you know as if you were up to nothing yeah and i think coming into it there was probably a different attitude too which would make sense from what you're saying about you know being more of a regular season game i think the people probably weren't coming in like they were in vancouver going okay we've definitely got this or we've got a chance i think there's probably more doubt there yeah and that's understandable uh 
it's just more apprehensiveness. Like, there's more on the line now than there was in the first round. Were you surprised that Kerry Ramo got the start at home last night? Oh, not at all. Me neither. After he, how he played, he's going to be going until he starts to screw up or the Flames are done, one or the other. Yeah, no, I agree. I think... Um, I think Ramos definitely going to keep going until he. I mean, that's the way the whole season's been, right? Play till you're no good, and then we'll put the other guy in. Yeah, and you know, if say like the Flames do advance and they play Chicago and Kari Ramo plays poorly, then you throw Hiller back in. But you know, till then, it, you know, you just run with the guy that's doing well right now, and that's Ramo. So go for it. Yeah, that's what you got to do, and I think it. It helps to change things up as well with, um, you know, with your team and your opponents because they don't know what to expect, right? They're looking at one goalie and a goalie that admittedly Anaheim knows very well in Hiller, and then they see somebody different, and that's going to shake them up too because there's no way that Anaheim would play their backup, Jason LaBarbera, at this point. I mean, you have no confidence in that guy. No. And... You know, Calgary is a bit like the 2002 Carolina Hurricanes where they had Kevin Weeks and Arthur Zerbe, and, like, they would alternate when the one guy played a real stinker of a game, they'd throw the other guy in. So, you know, it's a good, a good scenario to have more than one legitimately good NHL goaltender. I think the Flames are pretty much the only team in the league that's still playing that has that. Um, looking at this game, if we take a look at the game kind of period by period, I was surprised how early the Flames came out on the attack on this one. I mean, two minutes and seven seconds into the game, Brian Bolig got the first goal of the night. Not a guy I would expect. But, you know, when I watched the replay, if you didn't know that it was Bolig, you wouldn't have expected it. It was a great offensive effort. Yeah, the fourth line all night was actually quite good. They were. I thought that was probably our best line consistently throughout the game. And it, it was interesting to see Marcus Granlin draw in for David Wolf. And he contributed right away with a good assist by chipping it up to Raymond into the zone. You you made a good point there, David Wolf. Um he was in game two. I didn't really think that he did anything spectacular, did you? He was okay. Like he threw a few hits. He got a little under the duck skin. But you could also see that he wasn't quite fast enough to be as effective in the job that he was trying to do, which is basically be Michael Furland. Yeah, he seemed kind of lost out there at times. Yeah, like there were some opportunities where if he was a little quicker, he would have been able to throw the big hit, but the defender would just skate on by and like that would just negate the whole opportunity for the hit. If in the off season he can work on his skating and like become more like Furland in terms of his actual foot speed, then he could be a good wrecking ball for the Flames next year. But, you know, he wasn't bad. He wasn't great. But then again, the entire team was pretty much, you could say they weren't bad or great either. So, <laughs> Yeah, and then, as you mentioned, he drew out of the lineup in Game 3, which I wasn't surprised about just because I didn't think he played great in Game 2. And also um, back in the lineup in game three was Rafael Diaz, who's been out for the whole playoffs, and he took Tyler Watherspoon's spot. So it was good to get another NHL uh, body back in the lineup. Yeah, and he played rather effectively. I think he only played 10 or 12 minutes, but it was a very effective 10 or 12 minutes. Yeah, I we talked about it earlier. Um, uh, Diaz's time on ice was 10 minutes, 45 seconds. So yeah, he was, he was definitely out there for, you know, a good portion for a guy who's playing where he was. But yeah, I think we talked about how we were nervous sometimes about Watherspoon and with Diaz, I didn't have that nervousness. He's a guy who's been on the NHL team all year. He was part of taking the flames to the playoffs. I felt comfortable having him back in the lineup. Yeah, and he even played in the Stanley Cup Finals last year with the Rangers, so you know you're getting somebody who can play. 
period. And, you know, a, the Flames need to have six defensemen, and having Diaz there just takes a little bit of pressure off of the top three that have been <laughs> so overworked it's ridiculous. Yeah, I was I was happy that he was back for that reason. I just thought, okay, um, you know, he's in the lineup. He's going to help stabilize the D, and he's not going to make dumb rookie mistakes. Like you said, he's been to a final. Um, he knows what that takes. So I think that he was – it was good to slot him in. I don't know how long he's been at practice, if he's been playing for a while, or if they just jumped right back and said, okay, you're healthy, get out there. But he didn't seem like he'd missed much of a step. I do believe his first full practice was uh, the day before um, the second game. Okay. And then, like, he was practicing heavily. Like, they were bag skating him, trying to get him as quickly as possible into game shape. Which makes sense. Yeah. Well, when you're having a need to get the sixth defenseman back in there, you know, it's... <laughs> So, yeah, good good for them to get him back on the ice. Um, and I believe he was on the ice for the first goal of the game. I'd have to double-check that. But, yeah, so it was it was good he was contributing. And like you said, good everyone in the lineup contributed in this one, um, right from Bowleg all the way up to the first line. Yeah, and, like, if you look, like, for the goal scorers, uh, Joe Colborn, he scored his first career playoff goal. Michael Backlund scored his first career playoff goal. Brandon Bolig only scored his third goal of the year entirely, and yet his second of the postseason. And, well, of course, Johnny Gaudreau with his last-minute heroics. So it's good that they're getting more of a balanced attack from everywhere. And I, I thought that both uh, Joe Colborn and Mason Raymond had their best games as a flame in Game 3. Yeah, and, and let's talk about Raymond for a minute since you bring him up. Um, you know, Mason Raymond, I thought, in the first round, didn't look great. Um, at times he was insignificant, at times I thought he was a bit of a liability, but he definitely came out this round and looked like he belonged on the ice Again, especially in this game, he looked like he belonged against the Ducks. Yeah. It, in game two, I actually thought that Raymond was the Flames' best forward and the only guy that seemed to be directing the puck at Anderson with any regularity. And then in game three, I thought he was even better to the point where he, he did set up the first goal, but he just seemed more confident in his play and like he usually when he has the puck like he's either like okay how fast can i shoot it on net or pass it off so i don't have to play with it but it yesterday he seemed to be carrying it around the offensive zone looking for plays instead of just oh how how fast can i get rid of the puck yeah, no, that, that's a good assessment. I think you're right. He didn't just he didn't just take it and play hot potato with it. He was taking his time and really looking at where do I need to put this? Is it on net? Is it to one of my teammates? And and taking a minute to think about what he was doing. Yeah, it, like if he had been playing like that all season, nobody would at, be complaining about Mason Raymond in any way, shape, or form. No, it's that's just very unfortunately, true. you know, that's other than that, uh, the second game of the year against Edmonton when he scored the hat trick, like that was the only other really good game he had all year, other than game three. Yeah, yeah, no, you're 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 totally right there. Um, in the first round or the first, yeah, the first period yesterday after Bowling scored, we got two Ducks goals. Uh, we got the Patrick Maroon goal at 6.57 to tie it up. And then late in the period, Corey Perry scored to get them a 2-1 to one lead going into the into the intermission. And I don't know, even though the Flames were down, I wasn't too worried. Um, they seemed, even in that first period where they're traditionally not great, they just, they seemed like everything was clicking. Were you worried yeah. at all? Uh, 
Yes and no, but more so, like, it was how they surrendered the goals. Because uh, the first one, Ryan Getzlaff, he found the cross ice seam to Patrick Maroon, and it was reminiscent of Maroon's goal in the first game. It, it just seemed like the Flames' defense wasn't prepared, and then... In, with the second goal, TJ Brody, instead of just chipping it out, he got pushed over by Getzlaff, and then that whole play developed, and they scored again. And I just thought that the Flames' defense might be having the same issues that they were in Game 1 and Game 2. But thankfully, once the second period started... They played a lot more responsibly, like they normally do. Yeah, no, that's that's a fair assessment, I think. And then to me, the big turning point for the Flames was the Joel Colborn goal. The Calgary boy on the shorthanded um, play went up, no assist at four seventeen into the second period, and tied the game up. And when I look at, it, I think that's where everything turned around for the Flames. Yeah, uh, that was just uh, an excellent move by Colborn, faking out the backhand and then dragging it over. They did. Uh, I've played in net before, and a move like that, there is absolutely nothing you can do about that. No, and and that's his signature move. I mean, he even said after the game that. Um, he's been using this since junior, I think. So it was a good, it was a good deke. And I think you could tell if you watched the replay, Anderson knew at one point that he, he couldn't get it. Like he was done and yeah, there's nothing you can do and good for Colborn to be able to go up and, and deke Anderson like that. Cause Anderson's a tough guy to beat. Yeah. Uh, it was just an excellent play. Yeah, it was. And I think that really turned things around. Even when Bolesky scored about four minutes later to to get up um, for the Ducks and get the 3-2 lead, again, I thought that the Flames, especially in that period, everything was clicking. You're right about the defense in the first, kind of falling apart and not being able to contain the Ducks. But I think the second period, everything got tighter. Yeah, and the Flames, you could feel that they were going to start playing more desperate and like coming in and on waves and like shift after shift they're just gonna be relentless trying to find that equalizer yeah and it it felt though even though they were looking for the equalizer both teams were pushing equally as hard as far as i saw it of the ducks looking for the equalizer then the when the flames were looking for it the ducks were still trying to hold them off like it just it was this, I it was almost this smash mouth hockey of both teams trying damn hard to hold on to what they needed. The Ducks trying to hold their lead and the Flames trying to push in there. And I think it might have been the best, the best push I saw from the Flames all season. Well, not all season, maybe since Christmas, um, in the the back half of the second there to really try and get back into it before the third. Yeah, I can't argue with you there. They. The Flames needed to have that desperation, and I don't know what it is about this team, but when their backs are against the wall, they just seem to find that extra gear that you don't even think that they have it in them, and then they find it, and, you know, it's just something weird about this Calgary Flames team. They are always able to amaze us with what they're able to do and the the gears that they're able to get into. Yeah, because like you, the rational person's like, okay, well, Anaheim's got this now, and that's it. You're screwed. <laughs> but they found a way. And that was the big difference to me in this game is that the Flames didn't, you know, even when Anaheim would go up by one or two, like in the you know the first when Anaheim got the two to one lead. Um, Anaheim never really got up by two, sorry, but when Anaheim would get up by one, the Flames didn't let it deflate them. They just kept going, and I think that's the piece we missed at the Honda Center. Yeah. And then we got into the third period. Um, officially, one goal's on the score sheet, which was the late 
goal from Johnny Goudreau. I was worried here. When we got down to about that 19-minute mark, I thought, ah, I, the Ducks might have this one, but the Flames were pushing so hard, and good for Goudreau to get that last-second goal to tie the game up. I was I was watching at the bar, and the whole bar went nuts at that point. Yeah, when Hampus Lindholm shot the puck down the ice and he missed, I'm like, okay, Flames are going to score right now. And sure enough, I didn't think that Gaudreau would be able to find enough room on Anderson from because like my seats are on that side, and like I didn't think that there was anywhere for him to shoot, but he found that little tiny bit of a spot right over his shoulder. Really, you you, you knew right there that we that we were going to score. Yeah, there's just something about this team that. <laughs> They they have a panache for the dramatic, and you've seen that in past games, like in uh, like uh, when Russia had that in that World Juniors uh, that one year when uh, Jordan Eberle scored that last second goal in the gold medal game, and the guy missed on like a empty net, and then they turn around and scored right after that. This team just seems to have that magic where you just know when the other team just can't find a way to put the Flames away that they'll find a way to make it happen. And then obviously uh, we'll we'll talk about the we'll talk about the goal if you will in a couple minutes. Let's finish with this uh, game first. The Flames went to their first overtime game of the postseason. Um, the first one that's gone past three periods, and it didn't take too long. The At the 4 minute and 24 second mark of the overtime, Michael Backlund scored his first playoff goal to get the Flames the win. And I have to say that probably about the last two minutes of the overtime, best drive we've seen from the Flames in a while. If they can keep up that kind of offensive pressure next game, there's no way the Ducks can beat us. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Flames, I think the Flames have awoken. And like especially in that the third period at the end, on that man advantage, the Flames were cycling the puck quite effectively before the Gaudreau goal. Then Gaudreau scored, and then on the delayed penalty call, like uh, that was probably the best passing setup for a power play that I think the Flames have had in years let alone, you know, just this season. Well, that's a good point, too. The power plays, or I should say the man advantages, were our friend this game. I mean, the Johnny Goudreau goal was a five-on-three goal. So, you know, we had the two-man advantage, and I was worried we'd do nothing, but we took advantage of it when we got it, which was awesome. And then in the overtime, there was a delayed call against the Ducks, so the Flames pulled the goaltender and had six skaters out there. And I believe Backlund was actually the uh, the extra man, wasn't he? Yes, he was. So, yeah, he came in, great passing setup. They didn't allow the Ducks to get in their way, and that ended the game. And I was I was so happy they ended it with such an elegant, uh, an ele- an elegant offensive drive. Yeah, and it was nice to see that the Flames managed to screen Anderson so effectively because you could see because like there was the one camera angle and like there was nothing that Anderson could see because there was two Ducks players and Hoodler and Monaghan all in front of him on the one side so all Backlund had to do was find a way to shoot just a little bit off (laughs) Anderson and he managed to nail it off a stoner's thigh and in yeah and and that's the part some people didn't see was that it actually bounced off of clayton stoner and into the net but you know either way um nice that the game was over nice and quick and matt at this point when that final goal goes in what was it like in the dome was it was it as loud as it was in the first round oh yeah the 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 building was rocking that's for sure uh i think everybody was kind of at first like they were surprised that it went in because like all the game long whenever the flames would take a shot from the point it seemed like there was a duck player in front of it so 
it was a little bit of shock that it went through and then it went in. But once the red light went on, like everybody was pretty much jumping. I think I cleared three or four feet in the air. Really? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a big jump for you, my friend. Oh, yeah. Well, a little pumped. So let's let's address then the the question that's on everyone's mind. It, we had what was essentially, I think, an emulation of the 04 shot, if you take a look at it, from um, from the rookie sensation Sam Bennett. Sam Bennett shot the puck, looked like it went just over the line, and then uh, Anderson kicked it out. They didn't even stop the play at that point. Nobody thought it was in, and it wasn't until later when the goal was reviewed that on TV they slowed it down and we saw what happened. Did they show you the same footage when you were at the Dome? Yeah. Uh, they like When the icing was called, they decided to... like They typically show replays, and they showed what happened, and uh, it was actually Kari Ramo who was uh, flipping his lid he was pointing he was skating as hard as he could to center ice and pointing up at the jumbotron really? and yelling at the refs wow we didn't it was see quite that on funny TV. <laughs> oh yeah he was mad <laughs> wow we saw the footage slow down and when i saw the footage in slow motion i don't think that there's any question that the puck went over the line what do you think matt it's one of those things that it did appear to go over the line but there was no proper angle to see the play because the overhead view, because the net was slightly dislodged, it pushed the crossbar back. Because usually the camera angle, uh, it's slightly off center from the crossbar, so you can see the red line. But because the net was slightly elevated, it blocked that out. What I think that they should have done and should do for in the future is have multiple cameras not just one on either side of the post like they do now but have like 12 or 14 cameras in the actual on the crossbar and the post so that way you can kind of triangulate from different viewpoints all the different ways of looking at it those cameras though if they're on the crossbar are going to get broken so easily well, no, you can have them in the post. Because, like, I know they... Because I saw a picture online, and, like, the posts in the playoffs, they have, like, two holes in the side with cameras attached, like, inside the post. But it obviously wasn't enough, so that's why I think they should have more cameras, because why not? That's the thing that I think is the most frustrating about the play is that it's 2015 and they don't have a legitimate definitive way of tracking whether a play happened or did not. It's a good point. And like you look at tennis uh, with uh, the Hawkeye system and in soccer they use the same thing. I know that the NHL, it's a little more difficult because the goalie's always backing into the net and all that. But you got to figure that there is some methodology that you can say that definitively this is a goal, that's not a goal, one way or the other. And the fact that they're, they don't have a legitimate system in place is kind of bush league in the first place. Well, even outside of cameras, I mean, you know, we have RFID technology and stuff today where there's no reason you couldn't put it that I know of anyways. There's no reason technically that you couldn't take a chip, put it in the middle of the puck and put sensors on either side of the post. So as soon as the sensors cross uh, the post, it automatically puts off the goal light. Well, that's part of the problem is that uh, the puck's not necessarily always oriented ver like horizontally. Yeah, but you could you could probably do it even if it's not. I know it, it's just one of those things that they need to step up their game. Like even Major League Baseball instituted instant replay to check whether a hit was an actual home run. Like the fact that they don't have any technology to say whether a goal actually occurred or not is kind of 
bogus for a four billion dollar league like even if it costs 20 or 30 million dollars that's a drop in the bucket do you think that the fact that this happened again and the fact that it it wasn't i guess called right away um is going to further the cause for coaches challenge at all I think so. That this was a game between, say, the Philadelphia Flyers and the Tampa Bay Lightning. I don't care about either of those teams at all. But if the same play happened there, I would be equally concerned because of the fact that the league needs to be legitimate. And in order to have that legitimacy, they need to be able to make determinations whether a play happened. And that's lacking right now. And it's better than it was. Let's give them credit. Oh, no. I mean, having uh, having the war room in Toronto is better than what we had in 04. Oh, true. Uh, no argument there. And the fact that they do have multiple camera angles is great. It's just not far enough. And they do need to make more improvements. How that's achieved, I don't know. Because I'm not a technical expert with all the... Like the RFID chips, this, that, the next thing. I don't know what limitations there are, but something else needs to be done in addition to what they're already doing. So going back to the original question, do you think it was definitively in or out, or do you agree with the league that it's inconclusive? From the, Because uh, I watched the replay multiple times. I, there's no doubt in my mind that that puck was about a centimeter over. Yeah, I agree. Because there was one uh, camera angle, because the way it looked, because, uh, like, they don't view the 45-degree angle as being legitimate. But I wasn't looking at that. I was looking at where Anderson's pad was well, that's in relation to the goal line. Yeah, that, and, that's what I was looking at, too, and the pad is definitely behind the line. Yeah, because... Before he starts moving his foot forward, the puck hit right where the ankle part reaches the leg, which creates like a little V pocket. And that part was up behind the line sufficiently that the puck would fit there over the goal line, and the puck was there. So to me, there was no ambiguity there. That should have been a goal. I agree. Uh, Colin Campbell of the, uh, I don't even know what his title is anymore, uh, Senior Executive Vice President of Hockey Operations, actually had a quote today um, about the goal, and I'm glad the league addressed it. Uh, his quote is, it's like a horse race. You can't stand 10 feet ahead of the finish line and determine who won a close race. You have to be standing along the finish line, Campbell said. Also, don't forget this. The goal is painted one and a half inches below the ice. So you can put the puck on the goal line and stand 10 feet back and see white ice underneath it. The puck could also be in the air. I don't necessarily agree with his quote there, um, and this courtesy of the Calgary Sun, by the way. I don't necessarily agree with the quote because there's obviously enough room between the puck and the pad. So even though you might have been able to see white there, there's no way that you can use that as an excuse. Yeah, I wasn't even... Honestly, I didn't even look at uh, the puck itself in my determination it was where the pad was because i knew that the puck had struck the pad so if the putt the pad itself is far enough away from the goal line when the puck hits it then it's over the line and his pad looked to be enough out farther away from the goal line at when the puck hit the apex of like where his ankle was to me it was a goal but you know that's why the nhl needs to change because of the fact that you need to not have that ambiguity and you need to be able to definitively 100 percent say that yes that was a goal that wasn't a goal yeah for sure i think it stings a little bit more here because it was eerily similar not just that they called it back, but if you compare that shot and the goalie reaction to the one from Jelena and Habby Bulin in 06, or in 04, sorry, game six of the Stanley Cup Finals, it's eerily similar, don't you think? Oh, yeah. Uh, it was a mirror image of one another. Yeah. 
But at least the right team won this time. Watch well, it. And Colin Camel did Colin Camel did say here, um, if the call on the ice was good goal, then I couldn't overrule it. So, you know, they they are standing behind their referees there. As much as it didn't work out in our favor, that is good to hear. That the war room's not gonna say you guys are idiots, we're overruling this. The call on the ice always stands unless it's definitive. Yeah, and I can't argue with that. It's just that they need to have a better system in place so that way they can make definitive rulings. And, you know, I think one of the good things here is we know Brian Burke is very vocal. I think if if there's going to be a guy at the GM meetings and the, you know, governor's meetings who's going to be pushing for that and who might get his voice heard, I think Berkey would be that guy to champion a uh, different camera system, some sort of change. Yeah. Because I think if there was a, say like they had uh, cameras in the crossbar, right? And you could see looking down, straight down, that, yeah, that puck, there was just a hair of the puck on the goal line. Fine, no problem. But there was nothing there that, to say whether it happened or not. And that's what needs to change. Yeah, I agree with you. They, you know, and I, I always liked what, the NHL did in that respect when Shanahan was in charge of player safety and they'd show you the video slowed down and from different angles and they'd prove to you why such and such a guy was getting a suspension. And in this case, they can't prove that kind of evidence here. No. And it's one of those things that you just need to take that extra step further. Mm -hmm. And realistically, those cameras in the goalposts and that, it wouldn't cost that much. Like, it would cost, but... You know, considering it's a $4 billion league, it, nothing. Just add the cost onto the expansion fees for the new Vegas team. Problem solved. You know, so it's not a big deal. It's just, it's like when they introduced the goalie cam in the back of the net. That helped. They did the overhead camera. That helped. Now they just need to continue pushing forward and, like as Colin Campbell said, have a camera on the line to be able to see the photo finish Mm -hmm. yeah and you know it's it's unfortunate it happened the way it did but i'm pleased that the flames won i think if if the flames would have lost that game in overtime we would be having a very different discussion today and we'd have a lot more fans who wanted bettman's head oh yeah that this is uh, not a big issue because of the fact that the Flames won. If they had lost, uh, it would have been everybody on the warpath today. <laughs> yeah, and and hopefully we can look at it of kind of saying, okay, this is our one bad call from the league. It's over with. Now if we do go further, we're not going to have to deal with that again because it seems like every time we're in a must-win situation in the past couple of runs, the league has had a bad call against us. I don't like blaming the league or the refs for a missed call here or there. It, you know, stuff happens. And it, like the Bennett play, it happened. Oh, well, it's not a big deal. Things happened. They worked out. It, it didn't negatively impact the game. But you see there's a problem. Fix it. Period. Yeah. And if they don't fix it, then... that that's an issue but now they have a legitimate way of fixing it like they've already tested out the cameras in the uh goal posts add more of them and that'll help alleviate most of the problem and hopefully we'll see that for next year i'm hoping that uh you know we'll we'll be able to to say next year that steps have been made to fix it. And that's really all we can do at this point. They're not going to fix it before the next game. They're not going to fix it before the Stanley Cup Finals this year. That's a bigger thing. But I I would hope that now the NHL has the wheels in motion to say exactly that. Hey, guys, we see a problem. How do we fix this going into next year? But, yeah, the fact that Michael Backlund, I was really hoping that in the overtime, if we are going to get a goal, it was going to come from Sam Bennett just because... Uh, that would be fitting, but the fact Backlund sewed it up for us, I think it lessens the blow. Yeah, and the right team won because the fact that had Bennett scored, the Flames would have won in regulation. It took us an extra five minutes, but we still got the win. Yeah, it, not a big deal. 
everything happened properly, so it is what it is. You just carry on. <laughs> so, Matt, the Flames take to the ice again on Friday for Game 4 back here at the Dome. What are you expecting from that game? Well, one thing, uh, Anaheim apparently has been uh, is heading to Banff today, and uh, will be there tomorrow as well. They're not practicing, so I don't know... Like, uh, you saw the team have adjustments after game one. I don't know if they will at, for game four. The Flames, I think they just needed to get the confidence of getting a win to say that, okay, our game is good, let's go. So I think heading into game four that the Flames will be playing more like they normally do instead of tentative like they were in the first couple of games so you're saying i didn't hear this so you're saying that the ducks are going to banff and foregoing any practice before the the final game yeah as far as i know i read it online that they were going to uh, to banff it's like um okay you know you guys are playing a playoff series like well but i mean today's wednesday so they they could be going up wednesday coming back on thursday do we do we know if they're staying overnight or not I think they're staying uh, for both tomorrow and Thursday. Interesting. Okay. It's just weird. That's all. Yeah, it's kind of an kind of an odd thing to do during the playoffs. But yeah, so I I think you're right in a lot of what you said. I think this gives the Flames confidence, and I can see the Flames being defeated, being down two nothing in the series, but being down two to one in the series. You know, it's one more win to get in there. And considering that we've got the game at home, I see no reason why the Flames can't take in the Dome and even this up and go back to Anaheim. I'm hoping that the team that we see on the ice is the team that we saw in the third period in the overtime of Game 3. If they can play and have the offensive strength they had in the last, I'd say, 8 to 10 minutes of that third period and also in the overtime it's going to be tough for anaheim to get any offense going yeah yeah it's one of those things i can't say that anaheim's gonna lose or win Uh, they're a tough team and like even when they're not playing well they're tough yeah so the flames do need to be on the top of their game i'm hopeful that they come out and kick some butt but we don't know we haven't really seen anaheim too desperate in the first two rounds they handled the jets quite effectively so we'll see i just i'm hopeful that the flames can find a way to even it that's all we can do right now is hope and i think we'll have a better idea of how this series is going to shake down after game four yeah like if the ducks win then you know it, it's this the flame season's likely over the flames Just a matter have trouble of time. winning in anaheim and if the ducks win here i think that yeah we're probably done because then we go back to anaheim and it's going to be tough even tougher to win there because you'll have anaheim looking forward to playing chicago and never fun i guess the only last piece of news that we have is that the nominations have finally come out officially for the jack adams award Jack Adams Award is the Coach of the Year Award, and it's officially uh, stated that this is presented to the head coach who contributed the most to his team's success. And no surprise, we talked about this way back, at, I think, about the midpoint. Uh, Bob Hartley's been nominated. I would have been shocked if he wasn't. And he's been nominated alongside Pierre Laviolette and Elaine Vigneault. Uh, Laviolette is the Predators coach, and Vigneault is the Rangers coach. Surprised by the other two guys on this list? Not particularly. Uh, more so by Vigno, but the fact is that the Rangers weren't a very good team until he got there, and they won the President's Trophy, so I can sort of understand why. Laviolette, he performed well. I know Nashville wasn't very good last year, and they let Trots go. And Laviolette did some pretty good work for the Predators this year, getting them back into a top-tier spot. So I still don't see any way that either of those coaches win the award. It would be a travesty if Hartley didn't win it. 
I'm kind of surprised that Jack Capuano of uh, the Islanders isn't in there. I thought that of guys who took their team further than they should have been, that he probably took the Islanders a lot further than they deserved to be. Well, the, the fact that they struggled in the latter part of the season is probably why he didn't get it. Could be. Like, at least a nomination. Because the last month and a bit, the Islanders were pretty terrible. Yeah, that could be. You could be right. But yeah, if I look at the three that are on that list, um, if Laviolette or Vino wins over Hartley, there's definitely something going on. Um, the awards presented by the NHL Broadcast Association. But yeah, there's definitely something that's going to be going on there that's fishy because to me, there's no reason that Hartley doesn't win it this year. The Flames wouldn't be where they are if not for Bob Hartley. I'll just read for you here the description that the NHL's put out as to why Bob Hartley's nominated. Hartley led the Flames to a 20-point gain in standings over the 2013-2014 season, the highest jump among Western Conference teams and the third highest in the league overall, in capturing their first playoff berth since 2009. Calgary was among the NHL's best late-game teams, tying for first place in overtime wins, 9, Ranking second in third period goal differential, plus 31, third in wins when trailing after two periods, 10, and fifth in point percentage when leading after 40 minutes, 0.923 or 24 1 and 1. The Flames also recorded 1,557 block shots, top in the league and the highest single season total since the stat- statistic was introduced. Hardly the first time Jack Adams Award finalist. So, you know, looking at those numbers, I mean, setting an NHL record for the highest single season total since a stat was introduced on a team, like you said, who is expected to be where Edmonton is, that's impressive. Yeah, well, you also have to look at the individual players. Like, you look at Dennis Weidman a few years ago when he was with Washington. He was basically kryptonite for that team to the point where they would just only throw him out on the power play and like he'd basically be playing the Rafael Diaz, Tyler Watherspoon role five on five where you get like three or four minutes and that's it. And the change that we've seen in Dennis Weidman specifically, like he is playing like a number one defenseman, which... At both ends of the ice. And And even, even to be honest, not just when he was in um, Washington, but even when he first came here, I mean, there was talk for the first couple of years Weidman was aflame about he should be traded, he's not a good defenseman, and I don't think you hear anybody saying that now. No, even like in prior to this season when we were co-hosting that, that other podcast uh, with Kevin, uh, we were both saying like the Flames should look at trading Weidman at the deadline because he doesn't fit, but he hardly worked with him quite significantly, and Weidman is now as good defensively as he is offensively, in my mind. To me, I think the biggest, well, one of the biggest things, if you look at Hartley, is if you look down the roster of all three of those player of all three of those coaches and the guys in their roster, I don't think that there's any one of them besides Hartley you can say he's got a career year out of pretty much everybody. Even if they don't didn't put up career numbers, I can't look at this roster and think that there's anyone that's not having the best year of their career. Yeah, I can agree with that. You know, I mean, even a guy like Matt Stajan, we're seeing great performance from. David Jones has been excellent. Even a Rafael Diaz, who is a, a signing out of training camp as a UFA, who we didn't expect much from, is having a fantastic year. Derek England's on the first pairing. Like, he's getting great performance out of every guy on this roster. Well, even David Schlemko, who, you know, a waiver guy that Nobody was waived twice this season from two terrible teams. He comes in and he's looking like a top four defenseman. Yeah, even even Corey Potter's been looking pretty good. I know. It, it seems like everybody that comes in, like even guys like Josh Juris, who came out of nowhere, he, he's stepping up his game. And, you know, there's nobody in the league that has gotten the most out of their players like Hartley has. 
Well, to me, that's the job of a coach at that level. I mean, you know, when you're a kid, your coach teaching how to play the game, how to play the position. At the NHL level, these guys know that. The job of the coach is to motivate. And Hartley has shown us this year he's the best motivator in the league. Yep, and hopefully they can motivate the Flames to a Game 4 victory. We can only hope. Um, I've heard the name out there for Bob Hartley, and I, I kind of like it, the nickname Bob the Rebuilder. And uh, uh, every time I, I see his picture now, since I heard that a few days ago, I get a picture of that kid's character, Bob the Builder, and I, I just think it's a hilarious comparison. Yes, we can. That's what Bob the Builder says, and that's what the Flames will be saying going into Game 4. Yes, we can. And let's hope that we see the real Flames, the team that I think showed up in Game 3, and they follow their own mantra and never quit. And that's what's going to get them uh, past the Ducks. Talk to you next week, Matt. Take care, everybody. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.